I'm convinced that this strategy is the absolute best if you want to reach your financial freedom goals faster and have a business that fuels and funds your lifestyle. If you've heard of investing in boutique hotels or commercial Airbnb properties like cabin resorts and tiny home communities, and it's piqued your interest because of the size or the scale, or maybe because how cool these kinds of properties can be, I'm gonna walk you through all the areas you need to be aware of to get started investing in them. And boutique hotels or these unique multi-unit short-term rental properties are an awesome asset class because you can get economies of scale with just one purchase. Plus they can be super fun and you can be creative and create these really awesome spaces that people love. And ultimately, it's a way that you can enhance your lifestyle quickly by skipping the phase of buying a bunch of single family properties. What it really is, is a scaled approach to short-term rental or Airbnb investing. And normal short-term rentals can be awesome because they can get you out of your job faster, but they can also create a new job for you pretty quickly too. You have to do everything yourself because you scale your revenue slowly and you end up working more hours in that irregular times. So in this video, I'm going to show you how you can skip this stage, or at least how I did, and scale into larger deals with boutique hotels and put systems in place to take you out of the day-to-day -day and treat it as a business. Starting from the strategy as a whole, all the way down to the exit strategies that will maximize your returns and your options, which I think you really like. And the points get progressively more impactful. So get your notes ready and write your questions down as we go. I'm gonna be replying to every single comment that you guys put to bring you as much value as possible, because that's what I do on this channel. So before you dive headfirst into boutique hotel investing, you should consider your long-term goal and how boutique hotels will help you get there. If you don't know your destination, any path is gonna get you there. But I'll share with you what the perfect deal looks like if there is such a thing, and you can decide for yourself. I'll say that in my experience, the best deals are value add deals. That means you're going to have to do some renovations and improve the operations so you can improve the income and the equity in the deal. And in commercial real estate, when you increase the income of the property, you increase the actual value of the property, unlike in residential real estate where the value is based on comparable sales. I've seen very few good deals where no renovations are needed and that has already sound operations in place, but this is where your opportunity lies. So to be successful in the space, you're going to need to be a problem solver and find value at opportunities. Now, the great part about this is you don't have to do everything yourself. You can obviously hire a general contractor to do the renovation work and even hire a designer to handle the design and the furnishing. And most of these deals have the income to outsource these roles and more, which is why I love them. They come with that scale in place. Ideally, your perfect deal looks like a mom and pop operated hotel that is outdated and poorly managed, usually because the owners are tired of running it or they want to retire or they just do everything themselves so the quality lacks. And with the ideal property, it isn't on Airbnb and they do little to no marketing and the owner likely lives on site in the manager's unit. So you can come in and bring an updated business model that's easy to implement, which is renovating and redesigning the units, putting the units live on Airbnb and then the other OTAs, and converting the manager's unit into a rentable unit to increase the income. And a lot of these mom and pop owners have owned the properties for a long time, so they have little to no debt on the property. So these are prime, like really prime properties to get seller financing on and just structured as a win-win for you and the seller. So that's what the perfect boutique hotel looks like, right? They come in all shapes and sizes, but that represents the overall template of what to look for when you're getting into the boutique hotel space. In this video and the series to come, I'm gonna show you how you can identify this ideal kind of property and then begin to implement these strategies. The first thing to consider is the market and where to buy. And I hear all the time, where should I look for boutique hotels? So let's answer the first obvious question of if you should only buy a boutique hotel near you. I think if you're a person that wants control and wants to be intimately involved in the day to day, then yes, buy something close to you. Or if the hotel is smaller and you don't have the revenue to hire a local manager and all you can afford is the cleaners and the handyman like with a short term rental house, then buy close to you because you'll still have some work to do yourself. You don't quite get the economies of scale with the smaller deals, but the barriers to entry are lower. And my first deal was an eight unit that opened the door for me and it built just the momentum, right? Going forward for me to get into bigger deals 
even though that would be too small for me today to buy. But that could be a good place for you to start. And what I emphasize and execute in my own business is really clean, really effective, and really efficient operations that do not take you to operate. So you can buy the destination market or anywhere else that you want. And ultimately, you want to buy something that can be marketable, meaning that the property has the inherent appeal and will make it easier to market and drive guests to book with you. Like these properties can work pretty much anywhere. If you create a super cool place, with amenities and great design, it will be easier to market and you'll be able to drive traffic to your hotel. So that's the location question. The other piece of that is, what markets work best for boutique hotels? And the short answer is really any market that works for short-term rentals. But just don't overthink it. It boils down to don't buy in a bad location. A decent location can still do really well, so don't get analysis paralysis over the market. The more important thing is to decide and then go. I wanna go fast. And if you need to, select two or three markets to start and narrow down as you go. Once you identify and pick your market, you start filling your acquisition funnel with potential deals to screen and analyze an offer on. Think of it as a literal funnel. The top is wider and gets narrower down at the mouth of the funnel where good deals are spit out. And the more you put in to the top, the more you're gonna get out. So the more leads you get, the more deals you screen, the more offers you put out, the more you will get success at the bottom of the funnel by getting deals under contract and getting deals closed. Crexy is one that I use to look at potential deals and it's kind of like an MLS for commercial real estate where brokers put their listings out and you can go search by you know your parameters, the size, the location, number of units, all these different things. And then LoopNet is another one that's similar to Crexy where commercial deals get listed by brokers. And if you're brand new or just starting out, start with Crexy and LoopNet and you'll find potential deals that you can analyze. And I'm sharing these so that you have options to go start your search so just go pick one and start, you know, taking a look. But I also want to talk to you guys about a couple other deal sources or ways that you can find deals. And one of the most important is broker relationships. So most commercial deals trade with brokers. So by creating relationships with these brokers in the areas that you're looking to buy in, you can get leads on deals that don't even hit those online listing sites yet. And then there's direct to seller marketing where you can pull a list of hotels or motels in your area with a service like PropStream or ListSource and then send mail, or you can call, or you can email the owner to generate your own leads. And really all the lead sources work. It's just a matter of what you need to do to fill the top of your funnel, to get more leads, to analyze, right? To screen more and to make more offers so you get more deals. So we've discussed how and where to find deals, now let's talk about how to analyze them. When it comes to analyzing deals that you get into your funnel, what you really are looking for is ways to make a deal by adding value. You aren't just looking for a good deal because most good deals get scooped up before they hit the market. I'm gonna make them an offer he can't refuse. So you have to look for ways to make the deal work by finding deals with problems that you're uniquely positioned to solve which you know, others might see as barriers. So this could be by doing a larger innovation or by adding units or by adding additional streams of revenue that others don't identify, all which are you know, barriers to them and opportunities for you. And this might be the most important part of the whole process because this is where you start to vet deals and test your operational assumptions and really put together the numbers of what makes a good deal. And so you guys can get started underwriting deals. In the description below is a link to the analysis tool that I use to underwrite all of my own boutique hotel deals, and you can go download it for free. So like, who likes free stuff, you know? So go snatch that and you can use it to start underwriting deals. Now let's talk about the data you actually input into the underwriting model. And there's three ways that I wanna talk about, one of which you're probably already familiar with if you already invest in short-term rentals and Airbnbs. And the other two make all the difference when you're underwriting commercial properties. The first one is AirDNA. And this one's really good for STR data because it scrubs Airbnb and Verbo. And you can pull, you know, the STR rates, the occupancy, the demand, all of that data from there. But it's STR specific data and boutique hotels are a hybrid of STRs and hotels. So it's not exact. And the second is an STR trend report, otherwise known as a star report. And you can get this on str.com, but be warned, it is $600. But this gives you all the hotel data that you need and is a great source of data. And most banks, and hospitality lenders will ask for it. But again, it's all hotel data. So it's not exact because your hotel is gonna function as a hybrid. But wait a minute, I just said AirDNA data isn't the full picture and the star report isn't the full picture. So how do you properly analyze a hotel deal? Well, it's not necessarily simple, but you do both. 
And this is what really sets you apart by doing the work that others won't. And that takes me to number three, which is to research comparable properties on Google and look for properties that are similar in quality and their offerings and in the amenities to what you plan to create. So if you're gonna be creating something unique that operates in the middle ground of STRs and hotels, then you need to do research both on STRs and hotels for similar properties that you can find and can then combine the two to build a data set that better reflects what you reasonably and conservatively expect to do with your property. And to see a full breakdown of how to analyze a deal in much deeper details, stay tuned for the analysis video later in this series where we'll go over some rules of thumb and tactics to find and identify the best deals in any market. But for now, go to the link below in the description, download the spreadsheet and just start messing around with it. Like get on Correxy and LoopNet and start finding deals and then plug in the numbers to get familiar with underwriting these kinds of deals. And the more you use it, the better you'll get at actually recognizing a good deal when you come across it. To underwrite your deal and be confident enough once you find a good deal, you're also gonna need to have a good idea of how you're going to run it. And operating a boutique hotel does vary pretty substantially from operating short-term rentals. Not so much in that it's a different activity, but that it's in more depth. It's kind of like going from playing tennis on the Wii to playing actual tennis. So with short-term rentals, your chances of failure is just lower, right? The mortgage and the expenses are lower, so one bad deal likely won't wipe you out. There's just less money at risk. But with a boutique hotel, on the other hand, the mortgage and the expenses are gonna be a lot higher and will likely involve investors. So you really have to be on top of your operations and know what goes into it. And one of the first operational assumptions to check is your labor cost or how many employees, physical or virtual, that you will need to run it. As a baseline, the thing is that you absolutely have to do is message and service your guests. You have to manage your rates and your marketing to get your rooms booked. You also have random administrative items thrown in there. You have to fix things when they break or get damaged and just be available to help and resolve issues when they happen and they inevitably do. And when you start, those are all likely gonna be hats that you wear. As you scale up though, you start to outsource and you can begin with the admin the guest messaging, and maybe even your revenue management and marketing, because these are the things that don't take an in-person employee and you can hire cheap virtually. I did exactly that when I scaled into boutique hotels. This is the easiest and cheapest place to outsource from the beginning. Like for a VA in the Philippines, you can expect to pay anywhere between four and $7 per hour for good service too. And this is where you really save most of your time. Then with on-site issues that your e-concierge filter, you can hire property staff to send these issues to when the virtual team can't resolve them. You know, think a disgruntled guest or someone checks into the wrong room or they get locked out or you know something like that. These things need in-person people. And you are either this person or you hire someone in-house to manage your hotel and they become this person. And the cool part about boutique hotels is that you can get all of this with just one purchase. The scale in this place is my favorite thing. And to keep it simple and in line with your experience operating short-term rentals, you can set up your property to be unstaffed and run really lean to where it's essentially a big short-term rental. You don't need front office and front desk staff like a normal hotel, and you can use the same smart locks you used uh, on your Airbnbs, and I like the Schlegen code locks the best, and then offer a self-check-in. Guests really like this because they want the standardization and the amenities of a hotel, but they don't wanna to go to a front desk and check in and you know jump through all those extra hoops. So with Boutique Hotels, you can provide the best of both worlds the flexibility and appeal of short-term rentals with the standardization and the amenities of hotels. You can also set up guest closets at your property and turn an old closet or an extra housekeeping room into a store place for guest amenities like extra toilet paper or towels or shampoo, whatever the, those things are that you provide. And then you can put an electronic lock on that closet and give out the code to guests when they ask for something. That way you can keep your labor costs low and not have to send someone out or go yourself every time a guest asks for something. I have these set up across all of my boutique hotels and it's a clean way to reduce on-site presence and your labor costs. All right, those are some of the key pieces of how you can operate a boutique hotel, especially a smaller one, which makes it a little bit easier and needs less staff and ways to make it manageable for yourself for the start. Now that you've picked your market, know how to find deals, know how to analyze them and have planned out how you're gonna run it, you can start to raise money and bring in investors to purchase your first deal. And Boutique Hotels are larger properties with higher purchase prices, obviously. So to take down the deal, 
you're likely going to have to bring in investors for outside capital, assuming you don't have all the capital yourself. And any time that you want to scale in anything in business, capital is a limiting factor. So let's dive in and solve that piece of the equation. And raising money is as much as an art as it is a science. And there are key things that you can do, like go to meetups and post on social media and network to fill your calendar with potential investor calls. And a tangible thing that you could do is underwrite hotels now to get familiar with them and then build a sample deal package to show potential investors what a deal with you would look like. This is something that I did early on with all my deals that I raised for and really just served to build my confidence and pitching an example deal and saying, I'm looking for this. And if I find it, would you wanna come invest in it with me? And that helped me get investors early on. And always structure those conversations as presenting an opportunity not asking for money. Asking for money makes you seem desperate, right? Nobody wants to invest with someone who's desperate. You wanna frame yourself and the deal as the prize and tee it up as a great opportunity for them to invest passively in a high yielding deal, potentially even being able to travel to the property and stay for free. And there's also tax benefits and depreciation. So there's a lot of benefits with these kind of deals for investors and you just need to find out what the investor you're talking to is looking for because they all have different needs and then show them how you and your deal provide that for them. And if you don't have a big investor base yet, start getting more active. Talk to people about investing, make posts about it, create lead magnets on your page, which are valuable pieces of content. In this case, focused on passive investing that people can download in exchange for their email address and build your list. And with everything you do, in-person networking, social media content, whatever, it's as simple as providing value to your intended audience. That being those, in this case, interested in passively investing and then asking them to reach out to learn more about investing with you. And you can start with people you know. Go through your contacts, talk to friends, ask for referrals, just share what you are doing and focus on connecting with people that you can help by providing a great passive investing opportunity. So we just talked about finding the money and raising capital. Now let's talk about structuring the actual deal. The cool thing about investing in boutique hotels is you can create two value drivers. And one is the value of the real estate that you're improving and increasing the income. And two is the value of the operations company itself or the management company that you build in order to operate the deal or the real estate. And this is the business side of it where your management company can be valued on a three to five X multiple of your earnings. And this is the format that companies trade on and it's super cool. Like when I sold my business, I sold not just the real estate, but the operating company or the opco as well and got paid for both. So to maximize the value you create, you can structure your boutique hotel business as a Propco Opco structure. And in simple terms, Propco is your property company, which is the entity holding the real estate. And the Opco is your operation and management company, which is your actual operations business that manages the real estate. And here's a pro tip. You have a signed management agreement between your Propco and your Opco and you get the benefit from both sides. You bring investors into your Propco and then you share ownership in the deal that way. And then your Opco is all you or you and your partners that help you actually operate the business. And remember, for any questions that come up for you, ask them in the comments below and I'll be replying to all of your guys' comments. Now, when you're raising money for Propco that you're buying the real estate with, you have different structures that you can use and there are pros and cons of each, but all of them work. So let's dig into that. And the simplest way to do it would be by bringing on debt investors, essentially making it a big burr or buy, rehab, rent, refinance and repeat. I'll just call this the burr BNB strategy in the short term rental space. This is where you bring in private investors that have a promissory note on the property and they get paid interest for lending, lending you the money. And it's backed by the physical asset. It's very simple and cheap to set up. And say someone loans you $100,000 that is backed by the property in exchange for 10% interest. Then when you complete the project, you can refinance the property with the bank and get them their money back and then go do the next deal, completing the burr strategy. The other way would be to bring in equity investors where the investors invest their money in exchange for ownership in the deal. You could do this via a partnership, joint venture agreement, or a syndication. And partnerships and joint venture agreements are also pretty simple. The investors invest X amount for Y percentage of equity in the project, then the cash flow, the appreciation, and the tax benefits are split according to the ownership percentages. You just need an operating agreement between you and the partners outlining who does what and who gets what in return. The other way to do an equity raise would be via a syndication where you bring in multiple investors as limited partners or LPs. So the LPs invest their money and you as the general partner or GP 
run and manage the deal and you have the say in how the investment gets carried out. And a typical split might be a 70-30 or 70% to the LPs and 30% to the GPs with maybe a 6 to 8% preferred return. And if that sounds complicated right now, that's all right. We're gonna dive deeper into it later in the series. This is meant to be an overview of how you can structure and fund your deal. Now, I've done all these structures and they all work. It just depends on which structure works best for your deal. And if one of these well, ways appeals to you, go do a Google search or put your question below and I'll try to point you in the right direction with the disclaimer that I'm not a real estate attorney, like definitely talk with a professional before raising money. And next is your exit strategies for once you close the deal and what you plan to do with it afterwards. So exit strategy seems to always come up and it's a valid concern. So let's talk about your options. When you first think about it, you have two main ways to get liquidity or your money out of the deal once you get the property stabilized, meaning you have completed the renovation and you've been successfully operating it at the improved level for 12 months. So you can refinance it to complete the Burr B&B and hold on to it for cash flow, which is what I normally do. Or you can sell it to capture that equity that you created and then go do the next deal. And I say 12 months because if you go to refinance, the banks want to see 12 months of financials to know the business model is proven out and that the property can cover the debt. If you're selling, potential buyers want to see the same thing to know the property actually makes money. So that's why I talk about 12 months and getting it stabilized. But another thing I love about this space, and stay with me on this, is you can also get your equity out of the deal another way. Remember that Propco Opco structure we talked about and I said I sold both of mine at the same time? That's one option, but you can also sell each individually. Say you wanna access the equity that you created in the property, but still want the cash flow from operating. Well, you can sell the real estate to a new buyer and continue operating it for them with your management company. It's the same thing that you did between your prop co and your op co, but now it's just a new prop co that's owned by someone else. Pretty cool, huh? And if you're considering selling the property after it's stabilized, I'll share some insight on that because I've successfully went full cycle on four boutique hotel deals now. So I've seen how these exits play out and essentially bigger is better. Generally over a million dollars on the exit gives you a bigger buyer's pool. But we'll dig into that deeper in an upcoming video. For each section that I highlighted over today, I'll be releasing a full length video on all these sections and the nuances and specifics of each one. So raising money, your operation, your deal structure. So make sure that you're subscribed to follow along. So there's everything that goes into getting started investing in boutique hotels. And out of all the comments posted below, I'm gonna be randomly choosing one comment to get a free resource that I built specifically to help you find, analyze, and lock up your first boutique hotel deal. Like I built this resource out of all the strategies that I use in my business because I wanted to help people get a jump start into the boutique hotel space. So make sure you comment below.